So welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, always one of my favorite uh, events of the year. So it's definitely a, a pleasure and a blessing uh, to be with you uh, today and also to be with you uh, in person uh, today. So this is a uh, very, um, very exciting. Uh, so uh, again, welcome to this, the 27th celebration of the Valerie Gordon International Human Rights Law Lecture and to our honorary guests, the Valerie Gordon family. Uh, each year, members of the family travel from all over the country to this event. We're thrilled to have Kristen Lamar, who is Valerie's husband, here with us in person today. And um, I was teasing uh, Kristen earlier because he, he's representing with the uh, Atlanta Falcons uh, hat there. So he traveled all the way from Atlanta uh, to be with us. And he has the courage to represent uh, the Falcons. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, 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 it's so nice to have you here, Kristen. It's always a pleasure to, um, to see you and also encourage any of our students, um, if you have time to you know, strike up a conversation with Kristen. He's uh, a font of uh, wisdom and also career advice. If you want to go into uh, death penalty work, he's a tremendous advocate. Um, we also have members of Valerie's family, including her sister, Dr. Carolyn O. Gordon, joining us via Zoom today. Um, hello and welcome to members of the Gordon family. Are you there, Carol? Uh, also, welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Tiffany uh, Joseph, uh, Associate Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Northeastern University, uh, about whom more will be said uh, later. Um, the annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture celebrates the memory of the late Valerie Gordon, class of uh, 93 a fierce advocate for human rights in the U.S. and internationally. Each year, this event brings outstanding lawyers, judges, scholars, and advocates who work to advance human rights to the law school to deliver a keynote address. Today, Professor Joseph joins 26 other dignitaries to this venerable lecture, including uh, Desima Williams, former UN ambassador to Grenada, the late Honorable Nathaniel R. Jones, the Honorable Albie Sachs, former judge on the Constitutional Court of South Africa, and uh, Brian Stevenson, acclaimed lawyer and social justice uh, advocate. Not that there's any pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we were joking earlier about uh, the fact that this is two years in the making, much, um, much uh, awaited. Uh, Valerie uh, Gordon was an African-American lawyer, graduated um, in 1993 from Northeastern University School of Law, a highly respected and valued member of this community. A former journalist and longtime anti-racism and women's rights activists. She was an active and committed member of the Kemet chapter of the Black Law Students Association. She was also a co-founder of the Students of Color Coalition. The SEC advocated for the law school to take action with regard to faculty and student diversity, an end to institutional racism, and attention to race, culture, and difference in the law school curriculum. As a uh, newly minted uh, law professor, Chris and I were just uh, talking uh, about this. You know, uh, being in the presence of Valerie and the power of her spirit, her intellect, and leadership, it was truly uh, amazing. And one of the things that I remember, again, as a newly minted uh, law professor, was that this was truly a different place. 
in a different place because of people like Valerie and Kristen. So again, Valerie is must, much missed by all of us. Because of Valerie's enormous impact here at our law school and beyond, the law school's chapter of the Black Law Students Association sponsors a human rights essay contest named in her honor for first year law students. The author of the winning essay is given the Spirit of Valerie Gordon Book Award. This 27th anniversary will go to a wonderful first year BLSA student, Edward Teddy Rickford. Teddy will read an excerpt from his award winning essay shortly. But first, we will hear from 3L Bianca Pickering. Bianca won the Spirit of Gordon Book Award in 2020, the year we initially selected the theme of displacement and invited Professor Joseph to speak. Unfortunately, the pandemic upended the lecture we were planning for 2020, and we had to cancel the event. However, we're thrilled today that Bianca, will, uh, who has been waiting graciously for two years now, will finally be able to share an excerpt from her award-winning excerpt. Again, I thank everyone for joining us today, and I now pass it back to John Vier. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Diaz Berka. Um, you kind of took my job a little bit from me, but I don't know if you guys get anyway. Um, so, this year, I have the immense pleasure of introducing both Yana Pickering and Edward Teddy Rickford as the recipients of the Valerie Gordon Essay Short. As a 2020 recipient, Yana did a fantastic job of introducing me, so I hope this year I can return the favor. Bianca Pickering is a third year law student from New York City education roots. While at Northeastern, she has taken advantage of the many opportunities to grow as an advocate by being in the Black Law Student Association, uh, being a member of the Criminal Justice Task Force, and a former teacher's assistant for the Prisoner's Rights Clinic. Even with the pandemic, she had the opportunity to intern with the New York City Commission on Human Rights, the Center for Popular Dem Democracy, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, and the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Post-graduation, Bianca will be joining the Philadelphia DA's office as an assistant district attorney. Teddy, who will follow Bianca's excerpt, is the 2022 recipient of the Valerie Gordon Award. Teddy is a first-year law student at Newsel. He's always had a strong interest in social justice issues, even from a young age. His focus on public interest and environmental law is a large part of the reason that he chose Newsel. In undergrad, Teddy majored in history, political science, and also minored in philosophy. After undergrad and prior to law school, Teddy's experiences included teaching abroad in China and working on key congressional races in California, Texas, and New York. In addition to these experiences, Teddy has been recognized for his impressive writing skills before, winning awards such as the Dexter Swing Prize, the Gardner G. Hubbard Memorial Prize, the Reader's Favorite Award, the Chaucer Award, the Bragg Medallion, and more. I'm excited to hear from both of these amazing recipients and learn more about their research and writing through the Valerie Gordon Award. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bianca Pickering. So I will be reading a short excerpt from an essay that I haven't seen in a while, but quite honest. The title is The Forgotten Refugees the quandary of the Democratic Republic, internal displaced peoples. Here's a quote by Warsaw Sharmstar. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under your feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath. Internal displacement is a global issue that plagues every country yet is often unknown to the average person without the stamp of refugee. Natural outcry and legal resource are minuscule. This is a tale of a country drowning in its internal displacement crisis while also trying to aid other countries navigating the same predicament. The Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, is the second largest African country. 
It, is, it, ha it also has the largest internally displaced population. While the cause of displacement in DRC varies, its turbulent colonization history, governmental instability, and the lack of international pressure regarding relief for inter internally displaced people, IDPs, has exasperated the problem. DRC is a country with immense opportunity to be a global powerhouse, but it remains plagued by its inability to develop a unified community to foster a robust economy. DRC's tumultuous history of being poorly managed, culturally conflicted, exploited, and politically corrupted attributes to the rise in, dis in displacement. It is nestled between nine other countries, Central Africa, African Republic, Angolia, Uganda, Rwanda, South Sudan, Burundi, Tanzania, Republic of the Congo, and Zambia. Beside its 25 mile coastline along the Atlantic Ocean, the country is otherwise landlocked. DRC is one of the most resource rich countries on the planet with an abundance of gold, tantalum, tungsten, and tin, all minerals used in electronics. Since colonial times, mining has been the foundation of DRC's economy. In the past, mining accounted for 25% of Congo's gross domestic product and about three quarters of the total export re revenue. DRC was once the, lar the world's largest global producer of cobalt and one of the largest industrial diamonds and copper producers. The poor management of DRC's gross resources has hindered its ability to become a developed country. It currently has one of the lowest electrification rates globally, with just 9% of its population having access to electricity. However, it has the potential to install up to 100,000 megawatts of hydropower capacity. It currently has only 2,542 megawatts of hydroelectricity. Also, DRC has one of the lowest human developmental in indexes, HDI. As of 2017, DRC has a life expectancy of 60 years old and 9.8 years of expected school. Due to its low HDI, nearly 31% of the country's loss of life is due to the inequality and in resource distribution. Furthermore, DRC's troubled travel infrastructure is a factor that has attributed to considered one of the most difficult places to do business. It has the most difficult transfer infrastructure in Africa because ground transportation is hindered by vast geography, low population density, extensive forests, and crisscrossing rivers. Although DRC has thousands of kilometers of navigational waterway, it has poor connection to its ports. Though DRC has abundance of culture and resources, it lacks the unity to foster a strong nation. DRC has over 200 ethnic groups with nearly 250 languages and dialects spoken. However, the four national languages are Swahili, Chisulibi, Lingala, and Kanga. And I apologize if any of my pronunciation was wrong. Which facilitates communication amongst various ethnic groups. The diversity within DRC has been a blessing and a curse, as rivalries between ethnic groups, ethnic groups are usually the catalyst for rebellion. The country has endured three civil wars. The first from 1996 to 1997, the second from 1998 to 2003, and the third, which is ongoing, began in 2003. In the origins of war in DRC, the author states, the DRC's problems go beyond civilian protection or armed groups. It is a place to observe things through their absence. There are many soldiers, but no state. Over 19,000 UN peacekeepers, but no peace. Countless armies and militia groups, but no single unified reason for their existence. Democracy is a human and constructive thing. And in DRC, its absence has nurtured a conflict so fully encompassing that everything seems to sustain it, whether it intends to or not. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Teddy, and I'll jump right into it unless there's a reason I should. <laughs> <laughs> so, the essay I'll be reading an excerpt from is uh, Black Displacement and Environmental Degradation. 
No place in the world does environmental degradation quite like the United States. Looking at the issue purely from a CO2 emission standpoint, the US leads the world in historic emissions. In other words, the United States has done more to contribute to climate change than any other country in the world. All of us will be affected by climate change in some way, shape, or form, but some communities have been more affected than others. This is especially true in the United States, where environmental degradation, a broad term which can encompass lead exposure, fine particulate pollution, and everything in between, has had a disproportionate impact on minority communities all throughout the country. For the sake of length and clarity, this paper will focus on how a policy of environmental degradation has impacted African Americans specifically. Additionally, this paper will also outline solutions that could help prevent the further displacement of African Americans while also helping to protect the environment. Environmental degradation does not happen in a vacuum. It has been encouraged by the government and if lasting changes to be achieved and must also be discouraged by the government. And exploring how government policies have displaced and marginalized black communities, it is important to analyze the root causes. In better understanding the root causes, we will gain a better understanding of the forces that continue to shape our world today. On its face, the mortgage interest tax deduction is a racially neutral policy that makes home ownership more affordable for numerous Americans via tax subsidies. The deduction dates back to the Gilded Era but was little used until the Federal Housing Administration began insuring homes with 30-year loans during the 1930s. Following this change, the mortgage interest tax deduction exploded in popularity. For European Americans, following this change, the mortgage, sorry, I'm kidding myself. African Americans, on the other hand, were systematically excluded from the program. This exclusion was no accident and often depended upon abhorrent policies that explicitly discriminated on the basis of race. Not only did the exclusion have a well-documented effect on long-term social trajectories, but it also had a negative effect in the short run. Owned to white plight, the tax base shrunk dramatically in numerous cities, thereby reducing the funds available for social amenities such as schools, hospitals, and firehouses. A recent study found that for every black arrival, two whites left the central city during the heyday of white flood. Had white residents simply moved to different neighborhoods within the city, the impact upon municipal funding would have been negligible. Instead, they moved to the suburbs, enabled by generous tax policies and government collateral in the form of federally insured mortgages. Once prosperous cities shriveled in population and wealth, between 1968 and 1969, Detroit lost 147,000 residents of the suburbs. Many new residents replaced the white residents, but not in equal numbers. Moreover, the new residents possessed less capital. With less tax revenue to go around, Detroit cut back on social services. White took root in social order, and African Americans with the means followed the white, their white peers to the suburbs. The more people moved out, the worse conditions became in urban settings, thereby encouraging others to do the same. This negative feedback loop played out all across the country and contributed enormously to the vacancy crisis in Detroit and countless other cities. The hollowing of the American city has had profound environmental consequences. By and large, people who live in cities produce less greenhouse gases than people who live in suburbs. After all, the people who live in cities tend to live in smaller spaces and consume fewer resources. Perhaps most importantly, People in cities tend to drive less than people who live in server, suburbs, which translates into a much smaller carbon footprint. The path to a sustainable future will not be an easy one, but one we must commit to all the same. Simply put, climate change gives us no other option. Going forward, we will have to address the factors that pull people from the cities to the suburbs. Some are cultural. The allure of a green lawn and a white picket fence have an enduring appeal for many Americans of different persuasions. Some, however, are economic and can be addressed by means of legislative action. 
The mortgage interest tax deduction has taken on almost mythic status in certain circles, but it's a policy choice, not an inviolable ultimatum from outside. Revising the tax code is admittedly difficult, and it's especially difficult when the benefits flow primarily to the well off, as is very much the case with the mortgage interest tax deduction. But the status quo is simply not tenable. Climate change is too urgent an issue for the government to continue paying people to live in communities without size carbon footprints, especially since people living in cities usually cannot avail themselves of a similar tax benefit because of the dearth of purchasing options. Limiting the mortgage interest tax deduction could allow the government to collect billions more in tax revenue, money that could be spent on climate change mitigation efforts. Even if the money were not spent on climate mitigation efforts, curbing the mortgage interest tax deduction would go a long way in helping prevent the displacement of African Americans. To understand why this is the case, we ought to consider the relationship between Houston and its suburbs. Why do we consider to be one of the most diverse cities in America? Houston is home to nearly 2 million Black people. The city's proximity to the Gulf has long been a draw, but that proximity now puts the city at risk with the increasing frequency of hurricanes and rising sea levels. If conditions become bad enough, many Black Houstonians will be forced to flee the city. To avoid this scenario, it is essential that more of the impermeable surfaces in Houston be converted to green space. However, it is even more important that Houston's eastern suburbs do the same as they are even closer to the high-risk flood zones. As it stands right now, some of the communities most in danger of flooding have the least incentive to convert impermeable surfaces to green space. Pasadena, a mostly white suburb east of Houston, serves as a good example of this. When it comes to tax collecting purposes, Pasadena has an incentive to develop almost every parcel of land within the city since residential units are more likely to provide taxable revenue than parks or wetlands. But without the mortgage interest tax deduction, many would not find it practical to live in a community like Pasadena because of the upfront costs associated with home ownership. Without the mortgage interest tax deduction, municipal officials could not be confident that destroying wetlands and greenlands for the sake of residential development would bring in tax revenue and would therefore be more inclined to preserve natural greenery. Keeping in mind that wetlands and greenlands are better at absorbing water than asphalt and concrete, this could go a long way towards reducing catastrophic flooding. After all, part of the reason Hurricane Harvey was so devastating was the abundance of impermeable surfaces in the Houston metro area. However, because of the mortgage and tax reduction, Pasadena has a vested interest in replacing permeable surfaces with impermeable surfaces, even though doing so increases the risk of catastrophic flooding all throughout the region. This is harmful in the aggregate for anyone who lives in the Houston metro area, but it is especially harmful for Black Houstonians since they are disproportionately likely to live in neighborhoods at most risk of flooding. If we want a more eco-conscious calculus to prevail, if we want a social justice mindset to prevail in Pasadena and elsewhere, it is essential we curb the mortgage interest tax deduction. Unfortunately, there is no one bill that will address all the issues mentioned uh, in this paper. It is possible a bill may come forward in that vein, but it is also possible that legislators decide to take a more piecemeal approach. Whether it is the former or the latter, it is important to recognize that legislators will not act on their own. Without pressure from us, legislators may not act at all. Valerie Gordon understood this well. And the legacy of good trouble offers a valuable template for Newsom students to this day. We would do well to remember her example, and her work is especially important to those of us who are interested in environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca and Edward. I am so very often humbled by the extraordinary students who attend this very special school. Good afternoon, my name is Elizabeth Ennin. 
I am the director of the program on human rights in the global economy, or PERGI as it's known here at Northeastern Law School. Over two and a half years ago, the leaders of the Black Law Students Association came to PERGI and said, we would really love to invite Professor Tiffany Joseph to serve as a speaker for the Valerie Gordon Lecture Series. I consulted with everybody, everybody associated with Fergie, and we all agreed that that was a beautiful and spectacular idea. So an invitation was issued and accepted. And then 2020 April, we were shut down because of the pandemic. Then came April of 2021, where we were able to hold the Valerie Gordon event. But Professor Joseph was very busy with her brand new newborn son. So today, April 2022, we embrace this long anticipated opportunity to welcome Professor Joseph to this law school and to this cherished event. I've had the good fortune of working with Professor Joseph for the last two years in the Partnership for Immigrants' Rights, and so it is a professional and personal honor and pleasure to introduce her to you today. After completing her PhD in sociology at the University of Michigan, Professor Joseph was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Scholar at Harvard University from 2011 to 2013. She then taught at Stony Brook University for a few years before joining the Department of Sociology here at Northeastern University, where she currently serves as an associate professor. Her research focuses on the interrelationships among race, ethnicity, immigration, migration, healthcare access, and healthcare policy. Her first book, published in 2015, was titled Race on the Move, Brazilian Migrants and the Global Reconstruction of Race. She's nearly done with her second book, tentatively titled All In, Race, Immigration, and Healthcare Exclusion in the Age of Obamacare. Today, as you know, she will be speaking on the topic of displacement, citizenship, and human rights challenges for the 21st century. Tiffany, we are so honored to have you join us as the 27th Valerie Gordon keynote lecturer Please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would first like to begin by thanking Elizabeth for her introduction, as well as the Black Law School Students Association for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, and honoring the memory of Valerie Woody, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here this afternoon to speak with you. Um, to Dean Hackney, faculty, students, members of Valerie Woody's family, and other guests. Um, thank you for taking time in your busy schedules to be here to celebrate uh, the legacy of Valerie Boyd. Um, uh, others have already mentioned how I was initially invited to give this uh, lecture back in the spring of 2020. So it's really, uh, really happy to be here today with you in person for this lecture. Before beginning, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence in memory of Valerie Gordon, whose passion and fight for human rights at both Eastern and beyond bring us here today. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and begin my remarks. So this year's theme is displacement. And I'd like to frame my remarks by connecting that theme to the concepts of citizenship and human rights challenges for the 21st century, as all of those topics have profoundly shaped my personal and professional life. I begin my remarks by discussing how personal experiences with displacement have influenced my professional interest in the topic as a sociologist and been the catalyst for my research and teaching and also engagement with various communities around those issues. I then connect both to what I see as pressing human rights challenges we face in the present time. I begin my discussion of personal displacement by acknowledging the year 1619 as a pivotal year of displacement. Many of you may be familiar with Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 project in the New York Times, tracing the history and impact of the arrival of the first Africans to the continental United States and other parts of the Americas lands that originally belonged to the indigenous peoples of those continents. When I initially planned to give this talk in 2020, it would have been the 400th commemoration of that arrival. Indeed, the year 1619 marked an important moment in history through the forced displacement of Africans and genocide of indigenous peoples in the Americas that corresponded with European, the European colonization era which had a monumental impact on the world, socially, economically, and politically. 
That displacement set into motion the development of intergenerational and international wealth and inequality between the descendants of slave owners, the formerly enslaved, and resilient indigenous peoples who survived conquest, conquest, between societies that engaged in the trade of humans and goods that became the foundation of the current global economic system. As a Black woman, specifically an African American woman from the Southern United States, I was born into and am a descendant of that legacy of displacement. Fast forward 250 to 350 years. Despite a civil war to end the institution of slavery and make African Americans legal citizens of the United States through constitutional amendments, African Americans and other Americans of color who had been incorporated into the nation through westward expansion and US imperialism were still not fully considered or treated as quote unquote Americans. Scientists of the time were even arguing that they were not members of the human family and thus not entitled to the same rights, privileges, and dignities as white Americans. In the Southern United States, the brutally violent Jim Crow racial regime resulted in the continuing political intimidation, social and economic disenfranchisement, and systematic murder of African Americans. This contributed to another displacement, the Great Migration of 1910 to 1970 in which many African-Americans left the South to seek what they perceived would be more peaceful and economically mobilized in Northern and Western cities. They were in search of refuge where they could access the human and alienable rights guaranteed to them by the US Constitution. However, they found that the racism extended beyond the Mason-Dixon line and still continued to limit where they could work, live, and go to school in more de facto ways. This is also a part of my personal displacement, as I am only one generation removed from this history, as the daughter, granddaughter, and niece of relatives who were legally excluded from being fully a part of the social fabric of this country. Indeed, some of my relatives participated in the Great Migration, leaving Memphis and the small northern Mississippi towns for cities like Chicago and Detroit in search of better lives and opportunities. And with that in mind, I'd like to shift my focus to discuss how my ancestral legacy of displacement contributed to my displacement in, in the pursuit of educational opportunities. Like my relatives who left the South for better opportunities during the Great Migration, I would leave nearly three decades later to pursue educational opportunities from which those relatives had been excluded. At age 13, I received an acceptance letter and partial scholarship to attend Phillips Academy, also known as Andover, about 40 minutes north of Boston, in one of the country's oldest and most elite high schools. Founded in 1778 with the aim to educate you from every quarter, Andover's founders likely did not envision that the school's motto would include someone like me, a Black woman from the South. Having grown up in, a, in Memphis, in a predominantly middle-class Black community, going to Andover was a life-changing displacement that challenged me academically and socially and transformed every aspect of my life. From there, I attended Brown University, becoming the first person in my family to graduate from an Ivy League university. Both places were pivotal through exposing me to diverse groups of people from around the country and the world. But it also made me acutely aware of profound levels of wealth privilege on the one hand, and inequality and exclusion on the other. Though I did well in both places, I was always conscious of my presence and how those places were not built for me. While sitting in centuries old buildings, I knew that had I been born at another time, there is no way I would have been a student at those institutions. But at the same time, I also realized what a once in a lifetime opportunity I had received to be educated among the world's quote unquote best and the brightest. Yet that did not ease the tension I felt in attending institutions whose annual tuition was more than what most Americans make in a year or that people in lower income countries might earn in a lifetime. Being in these elite institutions made me more conscious of the haves and the have nots as well as connections between the 1619 displacement and the current global economic system that keeps so many locked in poverty while so few hold most of the wealth. My displacement and pursuit of education in these spaces had made me more attuned to domestic and global struggles for racial, gender, and economic justice and the human rights associated with each. 
Those settings awaken my sociological needs. From taking classes on Blacks in Latin America to doing educational exchanges in South Africa and the Dominican Republic, I began to connect my personal displacement with that of other peoples who were on the move by choice or by force and who lacked the human rights to live with dignity around the globe. It was my interest in that displacement that prompted me to pursue a sociology PhD and become a professor. Transformed by what I had learned in the classroom and from my peers and experiences, I was also inspired by the educators who captivated me with knowledge of human struggles for social change and decolonization movements alongside civil rights activism in the US and beyond. I had always heard that knowledge was power, but I didn't fully realize that I could make a living from pursuing knowledge and use that knowledge to be a catalyst for social change. Just as my personal displacement led me to experience displacement through the pursuit of transformative knowledge, displacement has played a key role in my life as an academic. Much of my research has been centered around the role of displacement via migration and how that shapes the ways that individuals think about themselves and others in racial and ethnic terms. I also examine how societal conceptions of race and ethnicity, like the categories used to classify people, and also thinking about interpersonal and structural manifestations, structural manifestations of discrimination and racism, are transformed by the displacement of people. Such displacement has been pivotal in the development of US race relations but also in global constructions of race, given the dominant position of the US and global relations. In recent years, I have started to more closely investigate how race and ethnicity shape the sense of belonging, as well as the meaning of citizenship and human rights for people on the move, and what parallels that has to African-Americans' ongoing struggles for social, political, and economic inclusion in the United States. In the 21st century, United States, the intersection of race, ethnicity, and documentation status has especially been important in shaping individuals' lived experiences, health outcomes, and access to social services like healthcare. Amid dealing with the multiple pandemics of COVID, the ongoing fight for racial equality, rising inequality and poverty, and the important work of creating and sustaining true democracy in the US and abroad, this work has become even more pressing. In one of my earlier research projects, I relocated to a small town in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil to interview Brazilians who had migrated to the United States and subsequently returned there to make their lives in Brazil after the U.S. migration. I wanted to learn how moving back and forth between the U.S. and Brazil transformed the way these individuals thought about racial classification, as well as perceptions of discrimination and inequality in both countries. To do that research, I learned Portuguese and as much as I could about the different histories of race relations and racism in Brazil and the United States. I put myself in the place of my respondents, uprooting myself, moving to a country with a culture and language different than my own, and had to navigate a new social context as a Black American woman who wasn't always perceived as Black in Brazil due to my lighter skin tone. Though I was in a more structurally privileged position than the return migrants I interviewed as a US citizen there on the Fulbright grant during research for my doctoral dissertation, the experience of culture shock, the physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion I experienced from adjusting to my new environment had some parallels. I found that as I got settled in the town and got to know more people through my research, People were impressed and wanted to know why an American would take enough interest in their small town and their lives to come and understand the impact of transnational migration there. As an immigration researcher, I felt and feel that so much of what is missing from contentious debates around immigration is understanding that the conditions of people's home countries propel them to move from everything and everyone they know and hold dear. Living in that city and interviewing people there made the human experiences and consequences of migration tangible to me in a way that sensationalized news stories and sound bites had not previously. I heard perilous accounts of people being woken from their beds in the middle of the night by police to be detained and deported back to Brazil with only the clothes on their backs. But I also heard the joy and resilience people found in accessing opportunities that were not available to them in Brazil 
given the higher amounts of economic inequality there. Most of all, I truly learned that in this country, we really have no idea how pivotal migration is to our economic prosperity in this country, but also in the countries abroad that rely on remittances that migrants send back home. Something I learned from that experience that I have carried with me in my personal and professional life is that we don't choose the countries or the places or the families or the bodies we're born into, but we have to live within the pre-existing social, economic, and political structures that shape our world and differentially shape our lived experiences on the basis of those factors. It was through conducting that research that I began to more clearly understand how the struggles of African Americans were relevant to the human rights struggles for inclusion of immigrants in the United States as well. <clears throat> While that particular project was about how those individuals' lives and perceptions of race were transformed by the US migration experience, I started to become more interested in the connection between health, healthcare, and displacement too. I found that in my interviews with Brazilian return migrants, the issue of health kept coming up in my interviews with them, even though I wasn't asking about it. Many of the people that I interviewed would say things like, when I lived in the US, I didn't have access to healthcare, or I was working crazy hours that I could not eat or sleep properly, or my employer threatened to call ISA on me if I, um, if, um, if I wouldn't make them pay me the wages that I was due, or if I threatened to complain them about paying for the, way, the wages that they owed me. Some even acknowledged that they returned to Brazil sooner than anticipated because their health had deteriorated so much that they needed regular health care, which they had better access to in Brazil than the United States, which to me at the time was just absolutely crazy to think that in the wealthiest country on earth, people don't have access to health care. And that was 10 years ago when I did this project. And that's still the case today, even with policies like the Affordable Care Act, which I've been researching more recently. Those interviews had a profound impact on me, so much so that that topic became the focus of my next big research project, examining immigrants' health care access in the US. By the time I finished grad school and started my postdoctoral fellowship in 2011, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare had been passed into law, modeled after the 2006 Massachusetts health reform. Obamacare was set to be implemented within the next two years, and I thought it might be an important time to begin that project. Little did I know that project would become a huge part of my life for the next decade, as I aim to concretely explore and understand how law and public policy shaped access to health care and other social services in this country for citizens and immigrants alike. More specifically, documentation status indelibly shapes eligibility for not only health care, but welfare and also things as simple as driver's licenses. As I start to explore this topic through interviewing immigrants, health care providers, and health and immigrant advocates throughout Boston from 2012 to 2019, the more clearly I began to connect historic and contemporary racial and anti-immigrant discrimination and animus in this country and its connection to laws and policies. The stories of immigrant families afraid to go to the doctor for fear that doing so will result in a police stop that may lead to deportation or jeopardize regularizing their status for common. Many felt that if they could become citizens someday, that they would be able to more fully participate in and contribute to this country. In those stories, I again saw parallels with my family's stories of being legally denied opportunities for education and social mobility because of their race, despite being citizens. In these stories, I could also clearly see the connection to the ongoing struggle for human rights that we continue to fight in the 21st century, particularly as the role of citizenship has become more pressing for establishing legal, social, and cultural membership in the United States and other nations around the globe at a time of what feels like unprecedented division, inequality, sickness, war, and impending environment destruction. It is from my personal and professional experiences and explorations of displacement that I have been able to think more concretely about the challenges that displacement, citizenship, and human rights pose for us in the 21st century. One of the biggest challenges that is that despite the humanity we share, human rights are not universal because we do not see or regard each other as universally human. 
Race, documentation status, national origin, citizenship status, and countless other social and political constructions and identities have fractured us so. A big challenge before us is assessing what citizenship actually means in this context. In the US and some other countries, one's race, ethnicity, gender, or religion has been used to determine who could become a legal citizen and entitled to associated rights and privileges. And although that is no longer legally the case in the United States, scholars have argued that being a legal citizen does not necessarily mean one is a socio-cultural citizen or fully perceived, treated, and regarded as belonging to the country or as a quote-unquote American. The continued disenfranchisement of African Americans since 1619 and into the present is a clear case of how being a legal citizen does not guarantee socio-cultural citizenship. Indeed, there are examples of other legal citizens here in this country and abroad who are not treated as social citizens and disproportionately experience negative social outcomes, live in poverty, lack access to quality education and healthcare. But unfortunately, we have also seen that lacking legal citizenship means that people can be rounded up, locked in cages, and deported without legal representation too. So, the challenge before us is, how do we reconceive citizenship to make sure that all humans are fully granted human rights without regard to their race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, social, et cetera, so, social orientation, et cetera? Well, one way is to treat individuals as sociocultural citizens, regardless of their legal citizenship, and work to ensure that people, especially those who are so often forgotten, who are contributing to our societies can reap the benefits of their contributions. Sociocultural citizens will not only feel that they belong, but also have access to shelter, subsistence, healthcare, the social safety net, workplace protections, affordable housing, quality education, and freedom to live and move without threat of victimization by others or the state. This is especially important now in the close of COVID and the continuing human rights struggle of Black Americans and so many others to be truly and fully embraced as members of the human family at home and around the globe. Indeed, when I think about this year's theme for the Valerie Gordon Lecture, someone who is passionate about human rights and who experienced significant racial discrimination despite being a U.S. citizen, I find myself being similarly compelled to use scholarship and education to advocate for the human rights of those who are so often forgotten and excluded, whether they be those who are immigrants and lack citizenship status, um, and thinking about particularly those in this and other wealthy countries whose economies depend on the labor of exploited migrants. I find that it is important to recognize our shared humanity, despite the differences between us, that try to make us believe in a global zero sum game where my success means that yours cannot come to pass. As I come to a close, I want to leave you with some words that I hope will inspire you to continue the legacy of fighting for human rights as Valerie Gordon did. Don't just be the change you want to see in the world. Inspire others along the way to make the journey with you. For when we work together to acknowledge the humanity of others, the displacement of our differences will allow us to create a better world. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll be moving on to the Q&A portion of your book. Um, if you have questions in the Zoom, feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Any questions? Uh, so, with your time in Brazil, uh, I'm curious, what would you say felt the most similar to the U.S., uh, and what would you say felt the most uh, different? So, I would say what probably felt the most similar was the recognition of the recognition of the exclusion of African descended peoples in both countries. Um, and in Brazil, it was more acute than in the United States because 
uh, economic inequality in Brazil is a lot higher um, than in the United States. And also there is a larger presence of African descended people in Brazil in the, in the United States. So a lot of people aren't aware, but actually Brazil received the largest number of um, enslaved persons during the slave trade. Um, and for that reason, it continues to have one of the largest African descended populations globally. Um, and one of the interesting things that's about Brazil is that after slavery ended, there was no equivalent to Jim Crow segregation there. And so for that reason, people thought that Brazil was a racial paradise compared to the United States. However, when you scratch beneath the surface and really start to look at, well, where do people live? What are people's opportunities like? And you start to look at income and other social indicators, you really start to see that the African descended population in Brazil is far uh, much more socially disadvantaged um, than the US. At least there's been research that's been done looking at those measures quantitatively. And one of the reasons that is, is because one of the things that scholars have argued is that in the United States, with a system like Jim Crow segregation and racism rooted in law, you could actually target law and say, this is what's actually the cause of this discrimination. But when you don't have a clear target in a country that had, does not have that similar history, it makes it more difficult to recognize racism as um, the factor that is contributing to this inequality between both countries. So in terms of similarities, as I said, in terms of thinking about the disadvantaged position of African descended peoples in both countries, that was very similar. But I will also say one of the biggest differences was uh, in Brazil, uh, when I would travel throughout the country, when I would go places, it was very uncommon for me to see middle class, upper middle class Brazilians eating in nice restaurants or driving nice cars or living in nice homes. Um, and in the United States, that's something that's more common. And I would say that was probably the biggest difference that I noticed, in which made me really be able to understand the difference in how structural racism worked in both countries. The other thing that I'll say is probably quite different is that um, in the United States, because of the history of the one drop rule, if you have any Black ancestry, you're Black in the United States, it doesn't matter what your physical phenotype is. In Brazil, because of the history of racial mixing there and also demographically, there was a larger African descended population. Um, the population of people there, the phenotype is a lot more racially mixed. And what that means is that in Brazil, uh, if you have racially mixed ancestry, that allows you to exit out of the Black category. Mm -hmm. And so in Brazil, if you have African ancestry, but your phenotype is lighter or whiter, you can accept classify as and be classified by other people in Brazil as white. The opposite, you, that usually does not happen in the United States. And so in terms of thinking about the boundaries and the construction of Blackness in the US and Brazil, those are quite different in the sense that a number of people who were thought to be Black in the United States would not be Black in Brazil. And that was something that I encountered myself while living there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to follow up with that question because something I've seen in my own family from the Republic public is that, um, oh, sorry, calling my mask. Um, something I have seen in my own family in, uh, from Dominican Republic when they've been here in the United States is precisely what you've been talking about, about how displacement kind of changes self-perception in their own perceptions of race. And in fact, their perceptions have become more egalitarian in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, it seems like you interviewed some people in Brazil who went back and forth. And what um, did you see how their experience in the U.S. might have impacted their own perceptions of race as different from or in contrast to their kind of environment? No, absolutely. So um, in that particular project, I not only interviewed return migrants, but I also tried to interview a relative, a non-migrant relative of the return migrants I interviewed. So I wanted to have a comparison of people who went to the U.S. and returned from the U.S. and then people who never went at all to really try to be able to understand how the impact of migration might have shifted the ways that those individuals thought about race. And one of the things that I found among the return migrants is that the way that they did think about race definitely shifted um, as a result of having lived in the United States. So they actually believed that you know, in spite of the history of racism in the United States, 
they saw that there were more opportunities for social mobility in the US compared to Brazil, and especially for Black Americans compared to Black Brazilians. And so one of the ways that they made that comparison was people would talk about in the US, I saw, you know, Blacks had a larger presence in the media, um, you know, in terms of Black celebrities. At the time when I was doing my research, it was in the, uh, 2007 to 2008, so it overlapped with the 2008 presidential election when Barack Obama was a nominee. And so that also kind of gave credence to this perception that Black Americans have far more opportunities for social mobility than Black Brazilians. So even though the US is a more racist country overtly, there is social opportunity and mobility for everyone. So people did believe that the US was more socially mobile, even though they thought the US was more racist at the same time, which I thought was interesting. The other thing that return migrants talked about too is that after having lived in the US, uh, they came back to Brazil advocating for themselves more. So if people felt like they were mistreated or discriminated against, they would actually complain about it. Um, and it's interesting because some of the non-migrants would talk about how return migrants would come back to the city and they would file lawsuits if they felt like they were treated, mistreated in a particular case on the basis of race or some other. Um, characteristics. And people saw that as very related to these people having become Americanized and taking on sort of the litigious characteristics of Americans where if people feel like they are wrong, then they will file a lawsuit or they will advocate more strongly for themselves. And people thought that that was the case too, because in Brazil, there was a perception that if people are mistreated, they just kind of take it and accept it. Whereas in the US, people fight for their rights. And so there was this perception in that regard that the U.S. in terms of the history of political activism and a lot of people would talk about the civil rights movement and Black Americans having fought and advocated for social justice, that being one of the reasons that they thought the U.S., um, again, despite its racist history um, and being more obsessed with race than Brazilians were, people thought the U.S. was still a place that was more egalitarian, if you will, in terms of everyone can have access to opportunities or advocate or fight for themselves in a way that people thought in Brazil was not necessarily the case. Hi, I'm Robert Baker. I'm a professor at the law school. Um, I, want, I, I want to ask uh, a question about disfavored and favored immigrants, um, but also connected to the university. The university prides itself as being one of the most internationally diverse campuses in, in the US. Um, these are, we could call them favored immigrants. They may be temporary, but they're favored. And there's a large number, particularly uh, in, you know, in, in other parts of the university, but even here at the law school, especially now with L, LLM students who, who come. Um, and your project is to try to help students understand that they're disfavored immigrant communities. And I wonder what your experience is trying to navigate that dilemma mm -hmm. when there's favored immigrants in your classes and disfavored immigrants who are not in the community or disfavored immigrants who are hidden in, in large measure with one other additional complication, partially from work I've done in the past, which is the brain drain problem. Mm -hmm. That not only are there favored immigrants, but that the US preferentially draws trained people uh, from abroad and tries to keep them here to fill uh, niches and professions where we have inadequate human resources. So it's an open-ended question, but I, I wondered about your practice experience as a professor. Yes, um, so in terms of thinking about different types of immigrants, so I teach a few classes um, in, soci in the sociology department, but also in international affairs, where I also have an appointment, a joint appointment. Um, one of the classes I teach is on uh, race relations in the United States. And so in that class, even though the focus is on race relations and sort of teaching students about the history of racism and the development of race relations in the United States, immigration is a very important part of, of that class because I don't think you can teach about race relations in the US without teaching about immigration. And I don't think you can teach about immigration without teaching about race because those two things are very connected to each other. Uh, I also teach a class um, that is on race and migration. So actually thinking about the issue globally and how the social construction of race has shifted 
in response to these huge movements, migratory movements of people. Um, and what I do in my classes in terms of when I start talking about migration, what I do is I explain that there are different types of migration. So there's internal migration that happens within a country, there's international migration that happens, there are refugees, societies, there are these different types of migration that happens and how that's connected to policy and law and US immigration policy. And that's where I also teach about how U.S. immigration policy has very much been shaped by the country's racist past, too, in terms of shaping who could come to the country, um, at times excluding groups of people from Im immigrating to the country on the basis of the race. And so I make that a really key part of the course in terms of trying to get students to understand more broadly what is migration overall. And then when we start to think about it in more specific ways, we see that there are different types of migrants. And then also how law and policy plays a role in creating these different types of migrants. So in terms of thinking about different types of visas or different entry points into the United States and how law plays a role in that process. And so I approach teaching about the favored compared to the disfavored immigrants by framing it within that context in terms of thinking about law and policy being very important to that discussion and thinking about how U.S. immigration policies and laws has shifted over time in response to what was happening nationally in the country, who the United States was wanting to let in and who the United States was wanting to keep out and how that very much was tied to national origins and race and where people were coming from globally. And that's the approach that I take to teaching it and trying to get students to sort of connect these larger issues to their own personal experiences too, and maybe think about, well, you know, I'm here as an international student in Northeastern, but my path to Northeastern was very different from, let's say, someone who ended up coming across the southern border, or someone who came on a tourist visa and overstayed and it became undocumented, and then how that shapes your path or ability to be able to become a citizen, because that also complicates. Um, the ability to regularize or change one's status too. So that's the approach that I typically take. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but we really do appreciate you speaking today, Professor. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Presentation and lecture um, on behalf of the National Black Law Students Association Canada Chapter and Northeastern Law School's um, program for human rights and um, for human rights and the economy, global economy. We'd like to present to you this wonderful plaque for all your accomplishments. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's an honor. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome up uh, members of the Jordan family to give their remarks. Um, so we are actually joined by Christian Lamar and virtually for our Jordan. Um, Mr. Christian Lamar was Valerie Jordan's classmate at Museum class of 1993. Um, he's worked as a public defender since 1994, specializing in he currently serves as deputy director of litigation of the Georgia Capital Defender. He is a member of the faculty of the National Criminal Defense College and a veteran of the U.S. Army for six and a half years. So, Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's always great to be here. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Joseph, that was uh, outstanding. I mean, I learned so much, I'm sure a lot of other folks did, and thank you so much. Also, Dr. Joseph is my homegirl. <laughs> Shout out to Memphis. Uh, we were talking, and uh, she said she would talk a little bit about that transition from Memphis to Andal, which I, I can't even imagine. But thank you for the great work that you're doing. Thank you for speaking at Valerie's event here. And um, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I um, also want to thank Elizabeth and Victoria and 
Dean Hackney and the whole law school for continuing uh, this great program. Um, it is um, very humbling, but it is also very uh, empowering uh, for all of us and especially our family. Um, much of our family is on the um, on the Zoom. I saw I saw a cat and I saw Lois and I saw Carolyn. I saw Galen. Anybody else? Can... I don't know. I hope I didn't miss anybody, but family, shout out to the family. Uh, when I'm done, if folks want to say something up through the Zoom, they can. And also I saw Gordon from the class of 93. If there's other class members out there, thanks Gordon for uh, tuning in and being supportive. Uh, wow, 93, that's, damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you know, you know. Uh, but it's all right, we're here, right? And we came through uh, these last two years. Uh, I remember telling my wife, you know, we can just kind of make it to the other side. Um, and so that's another reason that I had to be here. Uh, and the other thing is seeing so many people, Brooke, uh, Professor Hackney, uh, Lucy Williams, and I just went through the, uh, the faculty that's still here from the time that I was here. And that is just a statement about stability. It's a statement about leadership. And it's a statement about this is a very, uh, very special uh, place. Um, as you know, I, uh, you know, I met my wife, uh, Valerie here, and we actually were married during our time here. Uh, I was telling, um, I think I was telling Victoria, it's like when I left uh, for law school from Memphis, and I think I was telling uh, Dr. Joseph, you know, two suitcases on the Continental uh, Trailways bus <laughs> all the way from Memphis. Uh, it was a culture shock for Boston, but little did I know that I was going to meet uh, this uh, fantastic woman, uh, Valerie Gordon, and that uh, in that short time together, it was so intense. Uh, we were able to have a son, Luke, and um, to um, just kind of leave our mark here. I was talking to one of the Boston members about, yeah, that was us. Did that chemistry chapter? All right. <laughs> uh, and also part of, um, you know, like uh, Dean Hackney talked about pushing some social change here at the uh, university, uh, at the law school. Um, and it's interesting and very ironic at a point in our history where in certain parts of this country, uh, it's basically a crime to talk about what um, Dr. Joseph just talked about, that teachers can be sued and that little did we know that in 91, when Valerie and I and students of color and Boston said, uh, no, people, y'all need to do better about this uh, <laughs> inclusion stuff with, in terms of race and class and sexual orientation. In fact, half the people that come here don't have no idea. And that's how law, culture, and difference came about. And that, Literally, we know that 30 years later that <laughs> law, culture, and difference would be possibly outlawed <laughs> in places. So that is, again, a testament to this place, but also the willingness uh, to have people come in who are willing to push, push, and keep pushing regardless. I mean, many times uh, we feel like, hey, we've done a good job. Right? You know, we got black folks here, it's more folks of color, more folks, you know, LGBTQ, and, and we want to pat ourselves on the back. That's good. But after you pat yourself on your back, you got to look and see where you still have to go. And I think having a place that's willing to continue to engage in that. And sometimes the conversations are not necessarily happy conversations, but that's okay. We family, right? <laughs> and that's what we do. Um, so, I just want to thank everybody again. I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, I feel the love. Uh, my, my wife is on. She was, uh, uh, has been a rock for me in terms of being so supportive of, of what we do here. And I'm very blessed to have that. So I love you, baby. <laughs> That's Shannon, Shannon Lamar. 
she's uh, she's actually in the midst of uh, uh, she's a counselor in public school. So she texts me. She's like, I got these kids coming in, <laughs> but uh, that's what it's about. Um, trying to do what we can where we are in all ways. So I'm very fortunate to have uh, to have known Valerie. I'm very fortunate to have the love and the respect of this law school, and we are very fortunate to uh, be able to celebrate. Her legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know. Is there any way anybody on the Zoom can say anything? Yeah, Carolyn should be able to talk. Okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead, sis. <laughs> oh, she's got to unmute. What's she saying? Uh, unmute. You <laughs> good, good afternoon. Thank you, Christian. No, you caught me off guard. I, uh, I uh, was thinking a lot of things and I just appreciate seeing you, Chris, first of all, and wow. just uh, happy to be a part of this even virtually. To Dean Hackney, to the school, to Dr. Joseph, um, thank you. Thank you for remembering. Thank you for continuing uh, my sisters, our sisters, our niece, our daughter's legacy. Uh, of course, for me, it's always bittersweet because as I celebrate my, as I celebrate Valerie Gordon, I miss my sister. And Dr. Joseph, I thank you for hitting and discussing and your research. And I just want to remind all of you all that this is closer to home than we realize. I, I reflected on even Valerie's death. And the reality was simple. Uh, when Valerie and Christian first graduated, they took the first position in Georgia. Valerie was already pregnant. They didn't have insurance because they were betwixt and between from students to now being full-fledged law-abiding citizens professionals. And unfortunately, when Valerie, after she had Faluke still in the hospital, she had fluid on the lungs. What the doctor did not do was order a simple x-ray and they released her from the hospital. Um, and that Thursday, and by Sunday, she was back in the hospital with double pneumonia and she did not recover. Uh, just a reminder that this is closer to home. It's not them, it's not they, um, it is us. It is you as law students, you will make that transition. And my prayer for you that as you fight for justice, that you will continue to fight uh, the healthcare system uh, we, I live in Mississippi now, which is so ironic, and um, we just experienced another health care uh, with my aunt this last week with just discrepancies based on social status, based on color. And so, Dr. Joseph, I appreciate so much the reminder today that um, there is still much work to be done, but it's so affirming to know that there are those who are doing um, I want to challenge the students. Thank you for your, your research. Thank you for your papers. Uh, I want to challenge you all to continue to fight. Pick one. There's a lot to fight out here. Just pick one. Mm -hmm. And just know your life does and will continue to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I had many conversations with my sister. And I always knew. I always knew that she would have an impact. She wasn't so sure because she was always the one in trouble. Okay, that's, that's what happens when you fight justice. You're in trouble all the time. So you just got to get used to it. Uh, so, and I told her, I said, you will, your name will be there. You will be remembered. And so even now, I challenge you all to just keep fighting your fight. Live out your truth. Um, you will march to a different drummer. But just remember, that doesn't mean you can't participate in the parade. And yes, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to leave with you today. Keep marching, keep doing your thing. Dean Hackney, you know, I appreciate you. You know your family. And hopefully it is my goal. I will be in Boston next year to sit with you all. Come hell, high water or COVID. Blessings, blessings. Christian, I'm hugging you from here. Shannon, I love you. And I just wish you all the best. 10,000 blessings. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Okayla K. Uzago, who's another friend of ours who actually went to school with Valerie. Uh, way back before law school uh, in college. And he has his own stories. And, and, and okay, Christian, I was just thinking, we really need to go ahead, family, we need to go ahead and put our stories in a book so people will know the Valerie that we know. 
but we appreciate you. God bless you, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Hackney, and you all just have a wonderful rest of 2022. Thank you.